from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. D. James Kennedy Ministries is standing for truth and defending your freedom. But we cannot do that without your generosity. With our new monthly automatic giving program, you can conveniently ensure that we are able to broadcast the gospel, train Christian leaders in Washington, D.C., defend religious freedom in court, and much more. Whether you can give $35, $50, or $100 a month or more through your credit card or bank account, your monthly donation will make an enormous impact for Christ, and it will entitle you to automatically receive our valuable monthly ministry resource. Contact us right away to join our convenient automatic monthly giving program and receive the powerful book, Make Your Life Count, as your first monthly resource. By God's grace and with your help, we will impact our nation and the world for Jesus Christ. Well, hello and Happy New Year. I'm Frank Wright, president of D. James Kennedy Ministries, where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. The news these days is oftentimes clouded with too much information. While news anchors often show false outrage to every little news story, one thing that is always important to be updated on is our national economy. You will see reports about unemployment rates, stock prices, and taxes. There's a great deal of talk about income inequality, government health care, and everyone getting their fair share. More and more, the American people are trying to vote themselves rich at the expense of others. Many of the younger generation dangerously believe that socialism works and is a good idea. But what does the Bible say about all of this? Dr. D. James Kennedy recognized that freedom was the best way to bring justice and prosperity to everyone. He peels away the myths about fairness and compassion and replaces them with scriptural truth in his classic message, The Christian View of Economics. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the fourth chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We will begin our reading with Acts chapter 4, verse 32. May we hear the inspired word of the living God. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that Aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And may God speak to us today through his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. We have seen over the years how religious liberty has eroded in this country, piece by piece, little by little. And I would also like to bring to your attention today that economic freedom, has also been slowly and silently been eroding over the years. And since this is the land of opportunity, I think we might do well to consider the things that militate against the continuation of that opportunity. A land of freedom, freedom of opportunity. I think it is providential 
that in the birth year of this nation in 1776, there was also published a great and monumental work entitled The Wealth of Nation, an investigation of the causes and nature of the wealth of nations by, of course, the famed Adam Smith. Now, Adam Smith was a Scottish philosopher and economist. He taught at Glasgow University, and what he taught was moral philosophy. And he taught that in a thoroughly Puritan University in Scotland at Glasgow. And here this man brought together some of the pieces that had been brought to light a couple of centuries before by Calvin and others that gave us, he put, put all of the dots together as it were, and gave us the first great complete work on free enterprise economics called capitalism. And so historians date the rise of capitalism from the same time as the rise of this nation. Coincidental, providential? Well, I think that we found that with the rise of capitalism, Europe, for example, which for centuries and centuries before that had existed on a bare subsistence level, began to rise economically, and that happened wherever this system was employed, and it was employed preeminently here in America. And it has resulted in more goods for more people than any other system in the world. America is not only the land of the free, it is the land of opportunity. It is a city set on a hill, a city of gold in the eyes of many people. Many in foreign countries think that the streets in America are made of gold and that this is the wealthiest nation in the world. If they can just get here, they can indeed realize their economic dreams. And so capitalism and America have the same birthday, an interesting thing. But again, there are those that would try to do away with that. In 1948, the Liberal World Council of Churches was formed in Amsterdam, and at the very first meeting, they called upon Christians all over the world to abandon capitalism and adopt socialism. They started Christian social organizations. They called for social justice. And indeed, many churches, the liberal churches, followed in their train and began to proclaim those views and encourage socialism. And of course, they declared that socialism was that which was taught in the Bible. So I think one of the first things we need to ascertain is, is socialism taught in the Bible? Well, let's go right to the citadel of their teaching and take a look at it. I just read the passage to you today. If you were listening carefully, I trust you might have been uh, arrested by the words from Acts 4, where we read, among other things, in verse 32, uh, that neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And verse 34, neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the pieces of the things which are sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Why, why that does sound like socialism or communism. From each according to his ability to each according to his need. Voila, the Bible does teach socialism. And thus, millions of Christians around the world were persuaded, but not quite so fast. A text without a context is a pretext. 
And this disjointed passage taken out of its context has been used as a pretext to sell a mess of socialistic pottage to millions of Christians in America and around the world. So let's continue and take a look at the context as it's found in the next few verses, where we read in Acts 5.1 that Ananias and Sapphira had a piece of land, they sold it, and they brought part of the money, and they laid that at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now keep in mind, one of the basic tenets, the most primary tenet of socialism and communism is either that the state owns property and the means of production, or at least it controls them. In fact, the famous Parisian socialist, Proudhon, is famous for a brief statement that has been repeated millions of times in the writings of socialists, and that is a definition of property. Do you know what property, how it's defined? Property is theft. That's socialism. Property is theft. And uh, you think that you have private property? No, there's no such thing. It belongs to everyone. It is the people's property and uh, it is owned and cared for for them by the state, who somehow or another manages to keep most of it for itself. But now what does this say? It says, verse 4, Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? <clears throat> Private property. The very antithesis of socialism or communism. God realizes that for us to exercise our responsibilities before him, both of justice and charity, it is essential that we own property. And therefore, God has guarded private property with the flaming sword of his own commandment, thou shalt not steal, is a divine guarantee of private property. And so, most everything that goes on in Washington today is based on the concept of social justice. Yet it would be interesting to find out how many people could define that term and how many people could contrast justice with charity. These are antithetical. They are virtually entirely opposite. What is justice? Well, interestingly, the famous statue of the Lady of Justice contains three very obvious things about it which define what justice really means. Do you remember that statue? We've all seen it many times. We notice the first thing about her is that she is blindfolded. And it reminds us that justice is blind. It does not discriminate. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old, black or white, tall or short, fat or thin, rich or poor, justice is the same for all. And that's the way it should be. Secondly, what does that lady have in her left hand? She has a pair of balanced scales, reminding us that justice is equitable that it is equal. There is equal justice for all under the law, we say, and that is the way it should be. And thirdly, what does the statue of justice have in her right hand? A sword. And what is the sword the symbol of? It is the symbol of the state. It is a symbol of coercion. As the Bible says, Romans 13, that the magistrate, the state, bears not the sword in vain. It's a power of coercion all the way to the taking of life. That is what it is. And there is a perfect definition of justice. 
It is non-discriminating. It is perfectly fair and balanced. And it is enforced by the state. It is involuntary. Imagine that you have been hauled into court accused of murder. The trial has gone on. They have found you guilty and they have sentenced you to die in the electric chair and you stand up and say, I've just about had enough of this. I'm not going to have anything more to do with your faulty legal system and you walk out of the court. You think that would ever happen? You'd never get to the door of the courtroom. It's not voluntary. Now, sometimes they say that paying taxes is voluntary. And some people have tried to find out if that's really true. Most of them you can reach at the penitentiary. Charity, on the other hand, is the opposite of all of those things. Charity is not blind. It sees, it discriminates, as do all of us in our charity. We see something that we believe is worthy of our support and we support it. But that doesn't mean we support everything. As the scripture says, is it not right for me to do what I will with what is mine own? Of course it is. But you see, charity discriminates. It weighs the good and the bad. Of course, we live in a society that would like to take discrimination and take it out of those areas where it is proper and it should not exist and make it true of everything so that no one is able to discriminate between good and evil, worth and non-worth, value and non-value. That would produce, if it were carried through, an absolute chaos of a society. Furthermore, charity is not based upon fairness. You don't give the same amount to all. You give to some and not to others because it is yours to give. And thirdly, it is not coerced. You do it voluntarily. Now, many people don't seem to recognize what is happening in this regard. Somebody, I think, put it very, very interestingly. They described it as a ball game. 50,000 people go to a baseball game, but the game was rained out. A refund was then due. The team was about to mail refunds when the congressional liberals stopped them and suggested that they send out refunds based upon the Liberal National Committee's interpretation of fairness. After all, if the refunds were made based on the price each person paid for the tickets, most of the money would go to the wealthiest ticket holders. That would be unconscionable. So therefore, the people in the $10 seats will get back $15 because they couldn't afford the better seats. Call that an earned income ticket credit. Oh, it's wonderful to win the semantic wars. By earned is meant that it demonstrates less ambition, less skills, poor work habits, keeping them at low entry level wages. People in the $15 seats will get back $15 because that's only fair. According to whom? According to the Liberal Committee. But people in the $25 seats will get back $1 because they already make lots of money and don't need a refund. If they can afford a $25 ticket, then they must not be paying enough taxes. As when we get through with you in Washington, you're not going to be able to afford those seats at the ball game. Now, people in the $50 luxury seats will get back nothing. In fact, they will have to pay an additional $50 because it's obvious that they have way too much money to spend already. And people just driving by the stadium who couldn't afford to even watch the game will get $10 each, even though they didn't pay anything into it because they need the most help. Now, do you understand? It is a transfer payment of taking money from some people and giving it to other people. Public charity, as contrasted with private charity, leads to indolence, while private charity encourages work. 
Could you imagine a 22-year-old that lost his job just lying around the house of his parents and watching television all day without even trying to find a job and expecting his parents to continue to support him? But my friends, that happens with public charity all the time. Not only for years, but for generations that will go on. And public charity tends to destroy private charity, already has to a large extent. There is one trillion dollars a year now that is unavailable for private charity because the government is doing it. And furthermore, public charity leads to unbelief. Private charity leads to belief in a providential God where public charity leads to belief in the state, which is antithetical to belief in God. And furthermore, it leads to a loss of freedom as well. Indeed, people can become completely dependent upon the state and lose their liberty, and also this may happen for generations. And finally, the welfare state socialism leads to a loss of meaning for life. The socialist says this life is all there is. It's pure materialism, there's nothing more, and therefore if you get your needs met, there's no other reason for existing. That's why Sweden, who is probably the most socialistic state in Europe, has the highest degree of suicide in the world. No, the Bible is right. Let him that will not work not eat. Many of us might find that to be a harsh statement, but I would submit to you that's the most compassionate statement about economics that has ever been made. It was made by God. Notice it doesn't say, let him who cannot work, let not him who is not able of working, but let him, not him who will not work, let him not eat. That would do more for the well-being economically of more people than almost anything in the world. And private charity would help more people in more beneficial ways than ever will be done in an ever-increasing socialist state. Now, the Bible teaches the very antithesis of socialism. It teaches that God is the center of our lives and our world, and that we should live according to his teachings. May we pray. Father, we pray that you will cause this nation to turn away from its greed and covetousness with all of the resultant conflict that is brought about, with everybody crying out, I want mine, I want mine, I want mine, and restore this nation to the system of freedom, not only politically, religiously, but economically as well, that made this nation great. We pray it in thy name, O Christ. Amen. What a powerful reminder from Dr. Kennedy that God is to be the center of our lives and our world and not the so-called trappings of the government. If you're watching this program today and you don't know what it means to put Christ first in your life, but you'd like to, you can do so today. You see, Jesus Christ came to give us life to the full in this life and in heaven for all of eternity. And his gift of salvation is free to all those who will place their trust in him. His death on the cross paid for my sins and your sins, a payment we could never make. And this gift is received by faith. If you'd like to receive this gift of eternal life today, we can go to God together in prayer right now saying this, Lord Jesus Christ, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask you to forgive me of my sins, cleanse me, and make me into the person you want me to be. I want you to be the center of my life. I place my trust in you, and I want to live for you from this day forward. In your name I pray, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we have a special gift to help you grow in your new faith. It's Beginning Again, the book written by Dr. Kennedy for New Believers. It's a great tool that it will help you learn how to study the Bible, how to pray, and even how to share your new faith with others. It's our gift to you when you write to our address or call our toll-free number. Be sure and ask for Beginning Again, and may God richly bless you. 
As Dr. Kennedy notes, there are so many falsehoods and misunderstandings about what the Bible actually teaches on economic issues. As we begin a new year, the creeping tide of socialism in America is something we all need to be concerned about. But it is by no means the only challenge we face. We want to hear from you to find out what you believe are the most pressing issues facing our nation today. Contact us today to receive your spiritual state of the nation survey. Fill it out and return it to us right away. And we will give the results to President Trump, Vice President Pence, and your member of Congress, and even influential members of their staff. This is the time to let our leaders hear from us so that they will know which issues we are most concerned about. To receive your Spiritual State of the Nation survey, simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339. Or call toll-free 888-332-3069. Or go online to djkm.org. And if you are able to include a generous donation when you contact us, we will also send you the brand new book we just published, A New Birth of Freedom, by our own Dr. Jerry Newcomb, and with a foreword by William J. Federer. This short book takes you behind the current headlines to show you the spiritual decline that's happening in America and how recapturing our Christian roots and a revival of the Spirit of God is the answer to our problems. This book will equip you to better understand and articulate what's gone wrong in our nation and how we can regain our freedom and prosperity. We will send you A New Birth of Freedom by Dr. Jerry Newcomb as our thanks for your generous donation. And no matter what, please make sure to contact us to get your copy of the Spiritual State of the Nation survey so that we can make your voice heard by our nation's leaders on what issues are most important to you as a Christian. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339. Or call toll-free 888-332-3069. Or go online to djkm.org. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Kennedy Classics. We'll see you next time. Today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.